Hello and welcome to your last lecture online for theory this semester. And today we are doing a portion of the lecture that's uh, for Friday. Um, and this one is on model comparison and theory integration. Uh, so it's slides 21 to 32 on your student PowerPoint. And what we're looking at, first of all, is Lee's model comparison article, uh, which has to do with looking at um, model of human occupation, um, occupational adaptation, the person environment occupation performance model, and the ecology of human performance model. And I have a couple questions for you for consideration as we get started. And the first is about MOHO. How much of the MOHO-based research has, been exam has examined and contributed to development of MOHO-based assessments? We got your answer? Okay, here we go. So it's 30%. So 30% of the literature out there that's been made on the model of human occupation has to do with the assessments that come with the MOHO. So that's quite a body of literature, and as we'll see, um, a very large percentage of the um, occupation-based model literature is on the MOHO that's out there. Another question for you. Of the four models reviewed in the Lee article, which one has undergone the least rigorous research? So which one do you think it would be? It's not MOHO because we've already said that's the best researched one. It is EHP, which has only six refereed or peer-reviewed publications, and those peer-reviewed peer-reviewed publications aren't necessarily extremely rigorous either, so um, that one is the least well-researched. Um, following behind that is the PEOP, which has 27 articles, and uh, OA has 31. Now one of the things that tells you is that if um, Jenica Lee did this review of these articles and um, has combined them into a paper for us, then that might mean that the literature review or the, the references that she has at the end of her article might be of use to us if we're looking for research based on these particular publications. Um, so that might be helpful to you um, in the future um, if you're looking for articles, say, for your process competency class. Um, that might be a place that, that can help you find those articles. Another question for you, when looking at the comparison of the focus, emphasis, and concepts of these four models reviewed in the Lee article, what concepts do all four models have in common? And this we've talked about before, so hopefully you're already thinking about what might that be. Do you have your answers? Here they are. Person, environment, and occupation, and all four also have some element of occupational performance although especially with EHP it's called something different. We call it performance range. So through looking at those different um, aspects, uh, Lee has given us a really good um, way of comparing and contrasting different occupation-based models that we can also generalize to the other occupation-based models that we have learned, um, some of which are Canadian, and we've been able to see some similarities and differences. So with your forum assignment this week, I had you fill out this table that talks about comparing and contrasting occupation-based models based on the theory analysis template that we got um, at the beginning of the semester that was developed by Kathleen Reed, actually. So hopefully you've had a chance to think about how are occupation-based models alike and how are they different, and maybe you've even come up with one that you prefer, and so we can uh, talk about that a little bit as we go on later today, too. I may do a list of some of the similarities and differences that I see happening um, and that Lee saw happening in her article, ways that occupation-based models are similar and ways that they can be different. And this is really important for us to start distinguishing um, the different characteristics and nuances of the occupation-based models so that we can use them in practice in the most appropriate way. So how do we combine these models in practice? And oftentimes what you'll hear if you talk to an occupational therapist in practice is, well, I use an eclectic approach. And a lot of times that can just be a cop-out, meaning I don't really know what theory I use. I just sort of use theory somehow, sometime. Um, and there's not really an established way that they're going about doing that. In fact, there really is no established structure for occupational therapists to combine theory and practice. So we have to think about how it is that we're going to do this. Moses Ikeugu, um, who I had the good fortune to meet last fall um, at the MOHO conference, um, 
developed a, a, an approach that he calls strategic eclecticism, which he borrowed from psychology. And basically the idea is that it's okay to combine approaches as long as you're very, very aware of what it is that you're doing when you combine them. So his method says that you first choose a theoretical practice model, or what he calls an organizing model of practice, that helps you deal with the client's primary occupational performance issues. So say you've got a patient who's had a stroke and you want to look very carefully at the environment for that person because you know that in order to enable them to go back home again, you're going to have to be able to um, adapt their environment to their current needs. So you approach them from an ecology of human performance perspective um, in selecting some of your um, questions that you will ask them during your occupational profile and in terms of some of the assessments that you're going to complete with them. So this is your organizing model of practice. Then as therapy continues, you might think, hmm, this person has some motivational issues that I'd like to address as well. So I'm going to pull in a couple of MOHO assessments, uh, maybe pick my favorite one and, and run it through with them and see if we can figure out what's going on in their volitional system that's impacting them. This is then considered a complementary model of practice. Now your um, organizing model and your complementary model of practice can change over time as that person's occupational performance issues change. But the more intentional you are about how you're approaching that and how you're shifting your own thinking in practice, the better off you're going to be in being aware of what it is you're doing with them and in the, having a likelihood of using theory in an intentional way um, that gets you to your goal in the way that you want to get there. Now, you might ask, well, what does that mean then in terms of when I'm combining occupation-based models and frames of reference? Um, so one of the nice things about starting with the occupation-based model is that that helps us to be holistic. We can look at the whole gamut of things that this person is facing and think about how can I approach this from an occupation-based perspective to get this person to do the things that they want to do. But your frame of reference is going to come in and help you figure out what do you want to assess, how do you want to assess it, and it's going to help you with some goal setting. What, what, how will I know when this person is, is functional when they've reached the, the uh, goals that I want them to achieve? So you're going to pull in a frame of reference. So, for example, with our person with the stroke where we've looked at EHP and the environmental issues and we've looked at some motivational issues through using a MOHO tool, now I might also think, well, they've got some issues with, with their motor use. They've got some coordination issues, um, some uh, hemiparesis issues that we want to address through, through rehab. So now I'm going to take a motor learning approach, and I'm going to assess them through task observation, and then I'm going to use some repetitive tasks in their natural environment using objects and portions of occupations of things that the person may want to do. So um, let's say this person likes to sew, um, but they're lacking fine coordination. What I might be doing with them is um, looking at a task that will help bring them to the level of sewing. So maybe it doesn't look quite like sewing. Maybe it's needlepoint because the needle is fatter, or maybe it's leather lacing or something where they can still start with that pinch, um, but isn't quite as fine as what they need to do. So now I'm choosing a treatment um, aspect, a treatment approach that comes from a frame of reference, doing it within an occupation-based perspective based on that model that I selected to start with. So to combine the occupation-based models and frames of reference, first we select our occupation-based model, which is usually more implicit unless we're really wanting to engage the patient in that um, process as well, in which case we might use something like the Kawa model. And then we're going to select one or more frames of reference um, that help us to be explicit with our practice. Now one of the things I want to caution you against when it comes to competencies um, and uh, other assignments going forward is that if you choose a certain frame of reference, be sure that your treatment approaches also come from that frame of reference. So like with our client before, if I'm talking about motor learning and task-oriented approach, um, I am not going to say that my frame of reference is, um, say, cognitive behavioral, uh, because I might be pulling in some cognitive behavioral techniques, but in actuality, my whole approach, my main approach is going to be um, motor learning. So that is the one that I want to be the most overt about uh, when I'm talking about it. 
So now, if you've been good enough to watch all the way through to the end with me, um, I have an extra point that you can get for your lab assignment. If you complete these three questions and bring them to me in written form at the beginning of class on Friday, I will know that you have, one, watched this video, and two, thought a little bit reflectively about where you've come this semester in theory. If you will recall, when we first started, I had you fill out very similar questions in regard to how you feel about theory and what your theory learning goal is. So now I want you to go back and think about the theories you've learned this semester and choose which one is your favorite. What's your favorite theory now? And you can pick more than one, that's fine with me. Um, how you feel about theory now is, okay, how have you, do, do you, are you still terrified of it? Do you have um, positive feelings? Are you still not so sure about it? But, um, you know, let me know how you're feeling. And then did you meet your theory learning goal? So do your best if you can't find it to remember what your theory learning goal is and tell me if you feel like you've met it. Um, and I would appreciate that. And I'll see you on Friday. Thanks.